99% of the time, pilots deal with non-normal or emergency situations. The plane ends up landing safely, sometimes without passengers even realizing what occurred. But what happens if, without realizing it, the pilots make a grave mistake, one that doesn't reveal itself straight away, and when it does, it's too late to recover from. Let's take a look at when an unfortunate sequence of events occurred on the flight of British Midland 092. It's a standard London evening at Heathrow International Airport on Sunday the 8th of January. Amongst the wave of departures is a Boeing 737 bound for Belfast. It's British Midlands Flight 092, carrying 118 passengers and 8 crew. British Midland Airways in 1989 is a modest but expanding airline. Originating in 1938 as a training school for RAF pilots, it's expanded over the years to become a serviceable short-haul airline, with hopes of competing with British Airways on some of its key routes. One of these is the London to Belfast service, which will be about an hour and a half flight, with a cruise altitude of 35,000 feet. Midland 092, climb to flight level 120. Climb flight level 120, Midland 092. The first officer flies the plane, while the captain works the radios. Captain Kevin Hunt is 43 years old, with around 13,000 flight hours. He has 763 on the Boeing 737, and just 23 on the 737-400, so he's fairly new to this exact model of aircraft. First Officer David McClelland is 39, with 3,290 hours, 192 on the 73, and 53 on the 400. A large portion of the British Midlands fleet is made up of Boeing 737s, but the 400 series has only recently been introduced, hence the relatively low number of hours the pilots have on this variant. The design of the 737 though allows pilots to rotate between variants with ease and with minimal additional training. Midland 092, track direct to the Trent VOR, clear to climb flight level 350. Direct Trent, climb flight level 350, Midland 092. The plane cruises through the layers of cloud. This is the third flight of the day for the pilots and they begin settling in for the journey to Belfast. 13 minutes after takeoff, however, as Midland 092 passes 28,000 feet, the pilots and passengers begin to feel a growing shaking. But this is not turbulence. And worryingly, as it gets worse, the pilots begin to smell something. Fire. Despite the troubling odour though, not one fire warning is triggered in the cockpit. But it's clear something is wrong, as smoke begins to build in the cabin. The pilots need to do some quick investigating. All right, I have control. Autopilot off. Roger, you have control. I think these fumes are coming from the cabin. Which engine is causing the trouble? It's the let. It's the right one. Okay, throttle it back. Okay. Auto throttle is disengaged. Number two, engine idle. It's 19 seconds after the onset of the vibration. During this time, the aircraft is rolled slightly left. As the first officer brings the number two thrust lever into the idle position, however, the vibration decreases and the aircraft rolls back level. The FO contacts air traffic control. London Center, Midland 092. We have an emergency situation. Looks like an engine fire. Midland 092, roger. Shut it down. Okay. Shut down engine two. Actually, it seems to be running all right now. Let's just see if it comes in. Midland 092, you are 15 miles south southeast of East Midlands Airport. Which alternate airfield do you wish to go to? 092, looks like we'll take it to East Midlands, but stand by, please. Realizing something is wrong, it's around this time that the lead flight attendant makes a PA. All passengers, please return to your seats and fasten your seatbelts. Back in the cockpit, the first officer gets out the engine failure checklist. Okay. Seems we've stabilized. I'll start the engine failure and shutdown checklist. We've still got smoke. 
Stand by, just let me call the company. The checklist is delayed as the captain radios British Midlands operations. In the meantime, the first officer completes the shutdown procedure for the number two engine. Despite the lack of verbal communication, the FO has shut down the engine in a brief pause between radio messages, so both pilots are probably aware that the engine has been shut down. Immediately, the vibration ceases, while the smoke begins to dissipate. The pilots commence descent, reducing power on the remaining number one engine. In their eyes, the emergency has effectively concluded, with the number one engine appearing to be working normally. In the cabin, however, there are still signs that something is very wrong. The unusual noise and vibrations continue, while there's a distinct smell of something burning, like oil or hot metal. Some passengers even describe seeing sparks coming from the left engine, as do the flight attendants at the back of the plane. Soon after commencing descent, the captain calls the lead flight attendant to the cockpit. Did you get smoke in the cabin back there? We did, yes. All right, well, we're diverting to East Midlands, so clear up the cabin and start packing everything away. Okay. And sorry to trouble you, the passengers are very, very panicky. Okay, I'll make a PA. The captain makes a broadcast to the passengers, describing the situation of the aircraft. He notes that they had trouble with the right engine, which had caused the smoke and vibration, but it had now been shut down and they could expect to land in about 10 minutes at East Midlands Airport. At the back of the plane, the flight attendants reportedly don't hear the PA, but some of the passengers are confused. The captain made reference to the problematic right engine, but they saw sparks, and some even described fire coming from the left. None of them bring this information to the attention of the crew, however. The smell of the smoke and fire has since reduced. Over the next several minutes, Midland 092 is vectored for the ILS approach to runway 27 at East Midlands Airport. And while the initial emergency has been dealt with, the flight crew workload is still high. The first officer is busy obtaining the weather details at East Midlands, as well as programming the flight management computer for the approach. While the captain is hand flying the plane, not an easy task with one engine inoperative. Now, what indications did we actually get? Just rapid vibrations in the aeroplane, smoke, yeah, that's about it. An important part of dealing with a non-normal is reviewing the situation to ensure nothing is missed. This is what the captain is beginning to do here, but the conversation is cut off by air traffic control. Midland 092, turn right heading 090, descend 4000. Left heading 090, descend 4000. Midland 092. And Midland 092, contact approach control now, please. Roger, Midland 092. East Midlands approach, Midland 092. Midland 092 approach, continue on your heading. All right, one engine inoperative descent checklist. Yes, go ahead. Pressurization. Landing altitude 306 feet. Recall. Checked. Auto brake. Set. Landing data. V-Ref set. Approach briefing. Completed. Midland 092, can you make a test call to the fire commander, please? We'll go, Midland 092. The first officer unsuccessfully attempts to contact the fire commander, then finally completes the approach checklist. Altimeters, 1018, ground proximity flap inhibit switch, flap inhibit. Midland 092, turn right heading 220, we'll take you south of the extended center line. Roger, right heading 220, Midland 092. Flaps 1, please. Flaps 1, speed checked. The 737 continues its descent on one engine. Soon after, Air traffic control brings it back on to the extended center line, and momentarily, it levels off at 3,000 feet, requiring a power increase from the left engine. 
As this occurs, the engine's instruments record a spike in vibrations. But soon enough, Midland 092 is cleared for further descent. Engine power is decreased, and the vibrations cease once again. Midland 092 descended 2,000 feet, cleared for ILS runway 27 approach. Descend 2000, cleared ILS runway 27, Midland 092. All right, down to 2000, localizer and glide slope armed. Checked. Flaps two. Flaps two. Speed checked. Flaps five. And flaps five. Speed checked. Localizer is alive. Gear down. Roger, gear down. Flaps 15. Flap 15. Speed checked. As is standard, the pilots have extended the flaps and lowered the gear for landing, but the extra drag generated requires an increase in power, and while the FO and captain don't realise it, this is the final straw in a critical sequence of events. We're losing engine Don't one. Sink. Uh, Don't confirmed. Sink. Try to Don't relight sink. number two, please. Okay. I'll see if I can restart it. With the dramatic loss of power on engine one, the crew attempt to restart number two, but they won't have enough time. The captain pitches the nose up, trying to reach the runway as the plane's energy dissipates. Sink rate. Sink Disregard rate. the fire warning. It's too sink late. Rate. Prepare for crash landing. Prepare for crash landing. Sink rate. Pull up. He tries to stretch the glide, Pull but he's up. running out of airspeed. The stick shaker activates, indicating an impending stall. Then seconds later, the 737 crashes 900 meters short of the runway, initially impacting the northbound lane of the M1 motorway, before coming to rest on the western embankment. Of the 126 occupants, just 5 survive with minor injuries, 74 obtain serious injuries, while 47 people die. Miraculously, not one motorist on the busy M1 is harmed, probably due to the light traffic late on the Sunday evening. Regardless, the crash of British Midland 092, which became known as the Kegworth disaster, is to this day one of the worst air accidents in the history of aviation in Britain. On the approach to East Midlands, the final straw in the critical sequence of events was the required increase in engine power. But what was this sequence of events? How did a standard engine failure turn into such a disastrous loss of life? Let's go back to when the failure first occurred. With the vibration, smell of smoke, and a possible fire, the pilots worked to diagnose the problem, and instinctively, they believed the fault lay with one of their engines. The instruments, however, would have looked fairly normal. We can see this through the first officer's hesitancy to determine which engine was in trouble. Due to the urgency though, the captain demanded for it to be throttled back immediately, removing any second thoughts entirely. His attention solely shifted towards flying the plane. Supporting the confirmation bias was the captain's belief that the fumes were coming from the passenger cabin. On older models of the 737, the air conditioning in the cabin comes from the right engine, but on the 400 series, his reasoning was flawed. The air conditioning on the new variant came from the left. Here we come across the first clue as to the cause of the accident. The fumes were coming from the left engine. Further, a closer look at the engine instruments would have shown the vibrations were indeed coming from the left. It's an extremely serious error to shut down the wrong engine in an aeroplane, but just as the first officer brought the right thrust lever back, the disengaged auto throttle allowed the left engine to recover from its surge, decreasing the vibrations and confirming to the pilots that the actions they were taking were correct. Minutes later, when the engine was shut down completely, coincidentally, the smoke began to clear from the flight deck, providing a powerful addition to the confirmation bias of the crew. The aircraft then commenced descent, and power on the crippled but operating left engine was decreased, removing any indication of its questionable performance. 
and with the crew busy planning the diversion, they didn't have time to effectively review the situation. So far though, we've been analysing what occurred in the flight deck, but an important contributor to the accident was also what happened in the passenger cabin. They saw signs of fire coming from the left engine, but none brought this to the attention of the pilots. The passengers and flight attendants probably believing that any information they provided would be irrelevant, and the pilots would know what they were doing. This is an understandable perspective, and a major reason why pilots are now taught to be as open as possible when communicating with the cabin, especially in non-normal situations. Back to the faulty left engine though, its next sign of impending malfunction was the level off at 3000 feet. Vibration dramatically increased, but no comment or action was made by the pilots. As a more constant power was required in the final stages of the approach, the shattered fan blade within the engine disconnected completely, causing additional damage and stopping it entirely. From here, as the Boeing 737 descended from 900 feet without power, the crash of British Midland 092 became inevitable. The impact of the Kegworth disaster was significant. Training to address the gap in communication between cabin crew and pilots was recommended, and is now standard across the aviation industry. While extensive research was undertaken into emergency procedures surrounding the disaster, the modern day brace position is a direct outcome of some of this research. British Midlands continued operating into the 2000s, rebranding as BMI in 2001, but following heavy losses in the wake of the global financial crisis, it was sold and dissolved into British Airways parent company, International Airlines Group. To this day though, British Midland 092 is still viewed as a harsh reminder as to what can go wrong when pilots shut down the wrong engine.